Well, good evening. Good evening. Good evening. Welcome to the uh, third in a four-part series on Jeremiah, uh, Into and Out of the Abyss. And as always, I want to thank uh, folks who brought food and cleaned up and set up. Thank you very much. that there were some who were brave enough to come tonight for the meal even though they had no food with them. Uh, they trusted that that was okay, and I said that last week. It just come, so if you don't have time to bring anything or you aren't sure you even belong there, just come. Uh, there will be plenty of food. As long as Mudeen is bringing something, there will always be enough. <laughs> the largest portions I've ever seen. Uh, uh, anyway, wonderful um, to have you here. And uh, another reminder that the presentations uh, are being recorded and will be on uh, the stTimothys.com website and the onetable.com website. Uh, the first two are on there. Uh, Chris uh, will have the third one on in a few days. Uh, and uh, don't look tomorrow, uh, but in a few days that will be there as uh, well. Um, you know, funny things happen when you're driving around Cincinnati, and um, today I was driving around, and I was thinking about uh, tonight, and um, I was suddenly reminded of a poem. And of course, Walter, you've heard him present before, um, I think he says the word poetry more than he says the word God. I mean, it just comes again and again and again. Uh, a reminder that, uh, that's no disparaging remark, uh, but a reminder that uh, these guys were poets. And um, I suddenly thought of a poem I love, and I thought, I wonder if this guy wrote this poem having just read Jeremiah, because I saw some similarities in the language and whatever. Uh, so I want to begin by reading this. This may have actually nothing to do with Jeremiah, and you may wonder why Roger picked it. It's a good poem no matter what, whether it's connected or not. Um, John Dunn, you may know, was a, uh, the dean of St. Paul's Cathedral in London from 1620 to 1630-ish, um, and uh, you know, did the things that deans do, but he was also a great uh, uh, poet. And you've probably heard this, this uh, poem before. It's called Batter My Heart. I think the word batter fits Jeremiah. Um, batter my heart, three-person God, for you as yet but knock, breathe, shine, and seek to mend, that I may ride and stand, or throw me and bend, your force to break, blow, burn, and make me new. I, like in a certain town to another do, labor to admit you, but oh, to no end. Reason your advice or enemy me should defend, but is captive and proves weak or untrue. Yet dearly I love you and would be loved fain, but I am betrothed unto your enemy. Divorce me, untie or break that knot again. Take me to you, imprison me. For I accept you and thrall me, never shall be free, nor ever chaste, except you ravish me. Walter, we're all yours. <laughs> There's some chairs over here. There's an empty Come on. When uh, Heather asked me to do this, she said, uh, what uh, dates do you want to use? And I said, uh, let's do it during the World Series so I don't have to do both of those things. <laughs> Let's pray. We hunger for your word because we cannot live without it. We attend to your word and stand to hear it. We sing in response to it. We say thanks be to God. We say praise to you, Lord Christ. But you are a God from whom no secret can be hid. And you know better than to trust our mantras of habit. Truth to tell, we hunger for your word when it is gracious, generous, loving, and forgiving. Otherwise, not so much. Not so much when your word tells the truth about us and exposes our contradictions. Not so much when you call us to actions beyond our readiness. Not so much when we get utterances of your starchiness and impatience with us. 
not so much when you do plucking up and tearing down, not so much. And yet we linger over your word as we do in this hour, so we wait for your address to us, all of it, that may come amid our study. We pray your speaking your presence among us, give us ready ears and good steady hearts. More than that, give us lives open to your lead, way out beyond ourselves. We pray in the name of your fleshed word, who daily calls us out beyond ourselves. Amen. Amen. Well, uh, you all uh, heard the text from Jeremiah 31 Sunday, that uh, one which Heather preached so well and Connie read so well. Did come on in? Thank you. Did you uh, notice anything about that reading? Did you notice it had all, all four of our verbs in it? So um, I thought, oh, well, it's a connection. So, well, we worked, I thought we worked really hard last week. We did hard, theologically hard texts and uh, literarily hard texts. So tonight we're going to uh, rest and uh, do poetry. Uh, so I'm calling, I mean, do prose, do narratives. I'm calling these narratives of contradiction, and uh, I put down a bunch of them. We'll do as many of them as we have time for. Uh, the, the narrative uh, segments are scattered throughout the book of Jeremiah, and some people think uh, that they are very strategically placed to give a kind of a structure and a form. Uh, we don't know who wrote them. Uh, they obviously are written by a, not by Jeremiah, but by somebody who claims to be reporting on Jeremiah. But when you uh, read these narratives, you can see that they are also uh, interpretively heavily laden with uh, theology or ideology. And what they intend to do in the, in the present form of the book of Jeremiah, I think they mean to uh, create a context for understanding the poetry, because the poetry, as I said on our first Wednesday night, is, is rather ad hoc and scattered and not organized. And I think that these um, several uh, prose passages uh, want to try to organize it. So the first one of these uh, is in um, Jeremiah 7. And what we're going to do is we're going to scan them. We're not going to uh, take time to read them, but you can follow it easily. Um, this is, this uh, uh, beyond the uh, New Covenant passage that we read Sunday, this is probably the most famous text in the book of Jeremiah, uh, chapter 7. It's called his Temple Sermon, because you can see in uh, chapter 2, uh, he is, uh, as, it, as it said, he is commanded to stand at the entry to the temple and uh, say this. And uh, uh, most people think that the sermon uh, runs through verse 15, and then the, after that, uh, you get a report on his uh, uh, internal um, negotiation with Yahweh, and probably then you see this long prose passage. It's probably additional redactional material in which the community liked this uh, or, or valued this sermon so much that they keep adding to it. Uh, but probably the verse, first 15 verses are uh, what we might pay attention to. And uh, you'll see that it, in verse 3, uh, it, is it is introduced by a standard formula that says, the Lord of the troops. So that, that's, a, that's a formula that always wants to suggest uh, God's great power. Um, and, and then it begins with an imperative in amend, uh, then a negative. And what he's doing in verse 4, he's mocking the liturgy. So do not say, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord, the temple of the Lord is this. Don't say that. Instead, then you go back to the imperatives. So this is, this is right out of the book of Deuteronomy. Amend your ways, 
if, now I want you to hold that, and with your other hand I want you to look at Exodus 19. I just want you to see this little preposition, if. This is the, this is the beginning of the covenant making business. In verse uh, 5, uh, Exodus 19, Exodus 19, 4, uh, God says, as it were, you have seen how I caused the exodus. Then in verse 5, now if you will shema, obey, shema, listen to my voice and keep my commandments, so it's conditional. I think that what Jeremiah is doing then in verse uh, 5, if is uh, echoing Moses, if you truly act in justice, if you do not oppress the immigrant, the orphan, and the widow, that's the big three of vulnerability, and if you do not shed innocent blood, and if you do not worship other gods, then, say so if, 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 then, you can come, you can come through here to a chair. Just come on. Uh, then I will dwell with you in this land, in this city, and in this temple. Uh, and then he uh, indicts them further in verse 9. This is one of two uh, passages of the prophets uh, that exactly allude to the Ten Commandments. Will you steal, murder, commit adultery, swear falsely, worship other gods, and then come and stand before me in this temple and say, we are safe. So the, 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 their life in, in public is a disobedience of the commandments, and then they come to church and expect to be safe. And then verse 11 is familiar to you, has this house, which is called by my name, become a den of robbers? Now you know that Jesus quotes that, but Jesus uses it very differently. You may recall that what Jesus does is to throw the money changers out of the temple, suggesting that the robbers are operating in the temple. That's not what Jeremiah says. What Jeremiah says is they do their robbery through the economy, and then the den is the place where you, it's the safe house where you come and hide from uh, the law. Um, then he says, you know, Yahweh says, you know that I got my eye onto you. And then there is this little historical um, introduction. Go to my place in Shiloh. Now Shiloh was a um, northern city sanctuary that was devastated in the uh, 11th century, that is four or five hundred years earlier, and was never rebuilt. So the, the, the archaeologists uh, in uh, the middle of the last century found the, the scattered stones of Shiloh, and Jeremiah says, go to Shiloh where I used to be present, and then he says, because you have done all these things of violating the, the conditions of the covenant, uh, uh, I, I gave to you and your ancestors, verse 14, just what I gave to Shiloh, and I will cast you out, that's exile, in verse 15. So this is a, this is a incredible challenge that is issued in front of the Jerusalem temple, and the reason to go to the Jerusalem temple was to celebrate the fact that we are God's chosen people, and this is God's chosen temple, and this is God's chosen city, and this is God's chosen king, this is God's chosen everything. And what the prophetic tradition out of Moses says, not <laughs> that you get no pass. So that would be like if you did in one of our steeple churches and then said something like, uh, go to Hiroshima if you want to know how it's going to work out. 
uh, and then he makes that bid for repentance. So you can see why I call this a narrative of contradiction. Uh, he contradicts the, the operational faith of exceptionalism. Now, uh, at supper we were talking about this a little digression, but you remember that uh, uh, Jeremiah Wright uh, uh, got his for saying, God damn America, and all that. This is what's being said. Uh, uh, that is, he is, Jeremiah is suggesting that the chosen people are coming under curse. And uh, what Jeremiah learned is that you can't really say that, and what Jeremiah Wright learned is you can't really say that. So one of the extraordinary things is that the stuff that you can't say, <laughs> they put in their holy book to remember. So that's, that's the sermon. Uh, you can see why we don't read this stuff in church too much. So. <laughs> now, uh, this may all be obvious, but uh, I'll see whether there's pieces of this you might want to ask about or stuff you saw that I didn't see or, uh, yes? I'm always confused by the day. Uh, was Judah, Judah fell in 722? Uh, and this is... No, Samaria, the northern capital, fell in 722 and Jerusalem fell in 587 and the assumption is uh, that this stuff is somewhere uh, probably between 605, which is Nebuchadnezzar's date, and 600. So I think if you would have asked, uh, how's this going to happen, uh, what the book of Jeremiah is going to say, it's Nebuchadnezzar. So uh, the, the, this, this sort of uh, rhetoric probably is located somewhere right up against that date, or uh, you, you remember that Jer uh, Nebuchadnezzar's first time invading Jerusalem was 598, so it, you can focus on either one of those. Uh, so it's probably right here somewhere. Uh, either Jeremiah's beginning date is 626 or 609. It's disputed. And if he started in 626, uh, he didn't seem to say much before 609. So it's this decade from 609 to 598 that is probably the most acute. And uh, so what he is imagining uh, probably uh, is that, that the, what the book of Jeremiah argues, as you know, is that, that uh, Nebuchadnezzar and Babylon are the tool whereby Yahweh uh, works out covenant curses and covenant punishment. Yeah. Other comment? Well, the second text is closely related to that, the trial. Uh, so these two texts are almost always uh, studied together. Uh, and here, uh, Marshall, you can see it says, at the beginning of the reign of King Jehoiakim, that's 609. So that's probably uh, where that was, somewhere there. What chapter, Walter? 26. And uh, what I should tell you about this trial uh, that this narrative reports is that many scholars believe that the, the uh, narrative account of Jesus' trial in the Gospels is very much patterned uh, after the trial of Jeremiah uh, because the, the, it was the same problem in which uh, Jesus was teaching things that were objectionable uh, to the Roman Empire and the, the, the Jewish leadership that, that colluded with Rome. Um, so you can see that uh, 26.2, you get a, a reiteration, stand in the court and speak to them all these words. That's, that's an echo of chapter 7. And it may be that they will shema and that they will repent 
and God says that I will change my mind about the covenant curse. So thus says Yahweh then in verse uh, 4 you get another if, if you will not listen to me and walk in the way of my Torah, uh, then I will make this house like Shiloh. So it's a reiteration. So beginning at verse 7, the priests and the prophets and all the people heard this sermon uh, and all the people said, uh, you shall die. What's, well, how's that come out in the New Testament? Crucify him. Same deal. Crucify means execute. Why have you said these unacceptable words that this city shall be desolate? So when the officials, see this was the religious leadership, the prophets and the priests uh, want to want to do a lynching, the, the civic leadership uh, then the, in verse 11, the priests and the prophets said to the officials, this man deserves to die. That's exactly how it works in the, in the trial in which the, 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 the populace said to Governor Pilate, you ought to execute him. And then Jeremiah says, uh, uh, verse uh, 12, it is Yahweh who sent me now therefore you can execute me, but what you really need to do is to mend your ways and Yahweh will change Yahweh's mind about the covenant curses, but as for me, here I am. Do uh, with me what seems best, only know for certain that if you put me to death, I am innocent and you will pay for it. Then the, verse 16, the civic leadership said to the religious leadership, this man does not deserve the sentence of death. How's that come out in the New Testament? What did Pilate say? I find no guilt in the man. Same, same deal. Now, verse 17 and 18 are really interesting. Before I read it, I want you to find Micah with your other hand. That's down toward the New Testament. Um, uh, you can work backwards from Malachi, and it's, these are little short books. Micah 3. I want you to look at Micah, th have it open to Micah 3.12. Okay, back in, uh, got that, everybody? Okay, back in Jeremiah 26. Then some of the elders of the land, these are, these are, uh, Rural Republicans, and rural, rural Republicans never forget anything. They know the text. So they remembered the prophet Micah from a hundred years before. They said to all the assembled people, Micah, who prophesied under King Hezekiah a hundred years ago, he said, quote, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall be a heap of ruins, and the mountain of the house a wooded height. Now look at Micah 3.12. Micah 3.12, that's what they're quoting. Therefore, Zion, because of you, Zion shall be plowed as a field, Jerusalem shall be a heap of ruins, and the mountain a wooded height. That is going to, the, the city is going to become an abandoned uh, property. This is, this is really quite interesting because it is the Bible quoting the Bible. And then the elders say, did King Hezekiah of Judah and all of Judah and all Judah actually put him to death? No, they didn't kill Micah for saying that. Did he not, did Micah not fear the Lord and did treat favor and did not Yahweh change his mind. And then these rural elders said, we are about to bring great trouble on ourselves if we execute this guy. And he got out of it. Uh, so he was saved by a, a scriptural precedent that prophets have to tell the truth and you can't execute them for telling the truth. Most amazing. 
Now, on that chapter, and then I'll stop, I want you to see the last verse of uh, the chapter, verse 24. But the hand of Ahikam, the son of Shaphan, the, the family of Shaphan, apparently was very a very big player in the politics of Jerusalem. The hand of the son of Shaphan was with Jeremiah so that he was not given over into the hands of the people. What I think is interesting about that is that we always imagine that Jeremiah was a loner. What this suggests is that he was a spokesperson for a, a, a political group in, in Jerusalem who was convinced that royal policy was a disaster and they were protecting their guy who, who critiqued that. What, what, the, what the policy of the throne was, was to resist Babylon. Uh, and what this party attached to Jeremiah said, it is God's will, that's what they said, it is God's will that you surrender to Babylon because better to be red than dead. Be better not to commit political suicide by trying to resist the imperial armies. So he was uh, protected and uh, came to live for another day. So that's the sermon and the trial, which is a kind of a package. And what I, what I want you to see out of all of this is that the, that the, the, the whole narrative sequence really wants to contradict uh, the dominant uh, political theological assumptions uh, of, the, uh, of the Jerusalem establishment. So uh, again, uh, comment on this? We can have a conversation if you speak up. <laughs> yes, Harold. Why, why uh, are they so far apart in the, in the text of the whole book? Chapter seven well, we don't know. We don't know why it got edited that way. There are people who think that uh, chapters one to twenty uh, is a very uh, careful architectural design that the editors put together. If that's true, and that's arguable, if that's true, maybe they didn't want to interrupt it for more. But but we really don't know why the editorial process worked that way. Yep. Okay. Uh, I called chapters 27 and 28 uh, um, the argument. Uh, in 2712, uh, Jeremiah, now, now, now the, 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 uh, the, the narrative, the prose narrative presents Jeremiah speaking in the first person. I spoke to King Zedekiah, and uh, King Zedekiah was the last king who uh, lasted uh, 10 years in this space between the first invasion and the second invasion. So he's in a, a very uh, weak uh, situation because Babylon has already arrived. Uh, and I said to the king, bring your necks under the yoke of the king of Babylon. Yoke is uh, the imperial control that issues in taxation. That's basically how the word yoke is used. And serve him and his people and live. Why should you and your, your people die by covenant curses? This is from the book of Deuteronomy. Sword, famine, pestilence. That's a kind of standard uh, lethal epidemic. You don't, you don't have to do that. Do not listen to the words of the prophets who are telling you to resist Babylon, for they are they are prophesying a lie, and Yahweh has not sent them. So that's the, he, he put down the gauntlet. Now, verse chapter 28. In the same year, at the beginning of the reign of King Zedekiah, that would give you 598. See, this is all very 
compact right here. Um, in the fifth month of the fourth year of, of uh, Nebuchadnezzar, that is, the prophet Hananiah, and the word Hananiah means Yahweh is gracious. Hannah is the Hebrew version of grace, so Yahweh is gracious. And what Hananiah said is, uh, I, thus says God, I have broken the yoke of the king of Babylon. I have, I have overcome the power of the Babylonian Empire within two years. See, this was the first exile. So within two years of that, 596, uh, I will bring everything back which Nebuchadnezzar took away. I will bring back the exiled king, Jehoiakim, that's another name for him, and I will break the yoke. So what he's saying is, within two years, we'll all be back to normal. And then the prophet Jeremiah spoke to the prophet Hannah. So you have these competing uh, prophetic announcements. And uh, what Jeremiah says is, Amen, brother, Amen. May it be just the way you say it is. But listen now to this word that I speak. The prophets who preceded you and me from ancient times prophesied war, famine, and pestilence. As for the prophet who prophesies shalom, when we get shalom, you'll know he's telling the truth. Now hold that and look at Jeremiah 6. In Jeremiah 6, verse 13, from the least to the greatest, that means everybody, everybody is greedy. The prophets, the priests, everybody is phony. They have treated the wound of my people carelessly saying, Shalom, Shalom. When there is no Shalom, they have acted shamefully, they have committed abomination, and they wouldn't even blush. So, and then if you look in chapter 8, um, you can see the same thing. Uh, in verse 10, everyone is greedy for unjust gain. They have treated the wound of my, it's a quote of the same, my people careless saying, shalom, shalom, when there is no shalom. So he says, uh, uh, the prophets who, verse, back in our chapter, verse 9, the prophets who prophesy shalom, uh, let's see if it happens. Then the prophet Hananiah, this is, this is a little street theater. Uh, the prophet Hananiah took the yoke off the neck of Jeremiah. Jeremiah had worn a yoke in the street to act out uh, Babylonian uh, conquest. And he took the yoke and he smashed it. And then he said, thus says Yahweh, this is how I will break the yoke of King Nebuchadnezzar. At this time, the prophet Jeremiah went away. Sometime after, he had to think what to do. <laughs> the prophet Hananiah, after had broken the yoke, uh, the word of the Lord came and said, Go tell Hananiah, you have broken a wooden yoke, only to forge iron bars in their place. For thus says the Lord, I have put an iron yoke on the neck of all these nations so that they may serve Nebuchadnezzar, and I have given him wild and all of creation. And Jeremiah said, listen, Hananiah, Yahweh didn't send you, and you made this people trust in a lie when you told them we'd go back to normal. Therefore, verse 16, thus says Yahweh, I'm going to send you, Hananiah, off the face of the earth. And the narrative ends by saying, yep, he died. <laughs> so it's, a, it's an argument about um, what is the fate of Jerusalem? What is the fate of God's exceptional people? 
And uh, the people who believe, the, like Hananiah, who believe the Jerusalem ideology thinks that nothing really bad can happen and it's going to be all right and the economy will soon be back to normal and, and we will resume our natural place in the world. And Jeremiah has this alternative word. Now here's a question. Where does the word yoke occur in the New Testament that you know? Take my yoke upon you. Take my yoke upon you. And Jesus' yoke is easy compared to what yoke? The yoke of Rome. Or the yoke of uh, heavy-handed uh, Jewish authorities. So Jesus contrasts himself uh, with these people who impose either tax burdens or moral burdens or cultural burdens of some kind. Being a follower of Jesus, he says, is easier. It's easier if you drop out of that other way and just do the little things to which we are called and uh, all will be well. That's, that's how he uses that text to make his case. And the book of Jeremiah, more than any other uh, prophetic book, uh, presents this endless argument between uh, official truth and uh, what they take to be truth from God. I preached a sermon a year ago to uh, a bunch of clergy, and it was about uh, the 10 things that a pastor can't say. <laughs> so try making that list. My point to the clergy was not you ought to say them. My point was, if you know you ought to say them and you don't, what you will find is your gut is being eaten out. And what you need to know is that most clergy live with that. Uh, it's not a happy place to live. So you can either take the argument as a kind of a public debate about competing ideologies, or you can uh, take that debate as a, a, an acute psychological tension within our own lives. Because much of the time, um, we know better than dominant public opinion. We know better because we are baptized. Uh, but we spend our time trying to negotiate that, or as uh, Jesus says, we try to have it both ways and serve two masters. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, what this text does is, uh, is make it available. So that's that one. Anybody want to pick up on it? Are you out there? Yeah. <laughs> okay. Moving along. Talk about 36. You will find that when people talk about prose, the three they usually talk about is seven, 26 and 36. I slipped that one in there. Uh, 36. This is, uh, this is very dramatic. In the fourth year of King Jehoiakim, that would be 605, so that's dated. So the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah and he said, take a scroll, take a letter. <laughs> And right in it, so what, what people think 36 tells us is how the book of Jeremiah came to be written. If that's true, this is the only book in, I think, the Bible, well, maybe some of Paul's letters, but certainly in the Old Testament, is the only one where we, we are given a glimpse of how it may have come into being. Uh, write all this down. 
And it may be that when they get this scroll, they will turn, and if they turn, I will forgive them. That means a revision of public policy. So Jeremiah called Baruch his scribe. According to this, he dictated it. He wrote his stuff down. And then Jeremiah thought, oh, this is National Secretary's Day. He said, it's too risky for me to go to the temple and read this scroll. You go, <laughs> and on a f special religious holiday, you read all these words. And you shall read them, after you read them there, you shall read them uh, in, for, before all the people, and it may be that they will repent. And Baruch did all that the prophet Jeremiah ordered him about reading the scroll. In the fifth year, now this is a year later, uh, all the people came to, and all the people came, and then in the hearing of all the people, Baruch read the scroll of Jeremiah in the chamber, in the office of Gamariah, son of Shaphan, for God's sake, the secretary, the cabinet officer. And when Micaiah, the son of the grandson of Japhan heard the scroll, he went to the king's house, to the cabinet room, and the cabinet was all sitting there, and it names a bunch of guys, and Micaiah said, uh, told them what he had heard from Baruch, and then all the officials sent a messenger and said to Baruch, bring the scroll that you read it here. So Baruch, son of Neriah, took the scroll in his hand and came to them and they said read it. So this is the third reading. And when they heard all these words they turned to one another and they said oh my God we must tell the king. So they asked Baruch how would you come into possession of these Pentagon papers? <laughs> and uh, Baruch says, uh, Jeremiah did it. And then the officials said to Baruch, very interesting, these officials are um, covering their asses. <laughs> Go and hide, you and Jeremiah. We don't want to know where you are, but you better get away from here now because there is going to be trouble. So, so they went to the court of the king, who is Jehoiakim, and the king sent to get the scroll, and he took it, so you can see the, 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 the narrative is playing great attention to what happens to this scroll. This is, this is, a, this is a radioactive scroll, and you better pay attention to, to what you do with it. Now the king was sitting in his winter apartment in the ninth month, of whatever that was, and there was a fire burning in the fireplace. Now get this, this is the first known example of the shredding of documents. <laughs> As the scribe read three or four columns of the scroll, the king ostentatiously took out his penknife and threw them into the fireplace until the entire scroll was burned up in the fire thinking that if you shred the scroll, you get rid of the danger. Yet, neither the king nor any of his servants was alarmed, nor did they tear their garments like they, they should have been upset. But they were so encased in their ideology of chosenness that they didn't have to pay attention. Now I want you to hold that and with your other hand look at 2 Kings 22. This is really quite amazing. This is a very famous connection. Uh, uh, beginning at 2 Kings 22.3, in the 18th year of Josiah, that's Jehoiakim's father, 
And uh, that will give you the date of 621. I didn't put that up there. So this is dated 621. And, and uh, the king sent uh, uh, Shaphan uh, with some money to renovate the temple. Uh, what, what pious kings always do is to renovate churches that they can be seen as pious. And, uh, you know, when you renovate a church, uh, maybe not an Episcopal church, but most free church of Presbyterian and those kind, if you, if you go behind the altar, uh, you will find angel wings from last year's uh, Christmas pageant and uh, some old hymnals and a couple old Bibles and a couple, remember those old fans from Undertakers? Well, I will put that all back there because uh, it's all show business. And what they found back there was a scroll. Now I should tell you what people think is what they found in verse 8 is the book of Deuteronomy. So I have found the book of the Torah and when Hilkiah gave the book to Shaphan, he read it. And he said, uh, Shaphan then took it, verse 10, and read it to the king, Josiah. And when the king heard the words of the scroll of the Torah, he was profoundly alarmed. He tore his garments in grief, and then he instituted a reform. Now, the reason I want you to see verse 11, he tore his clothes, which means he was reachable religiously. Now when you look back at our text, neither the king, verse 24, nor any of his servants who heard the word was alarmed, nor did they tear their garments because they were narcoticized. So the, the, many people think that these two chapters mean to contrast the good king father and the bad king son because the book of Deuteronomy and the book of Jeremiah, two scrolls, are intimately related to each other. And when, um, and when the, these, his advisors urged him to not to burn the scroll, he would not listen to them and verse 26 says, he sent a posse to arrest Jeremiah and Baruch because this is dynamite that undermines royal policy. And then verse 27, the, the scroll is relentless. You cannot get away from the scroll. After the king had burned the scroll, the word of the Lord came to Jeremiah, take another scroll and write down the same stuff. When the chapter ends by saying uh, Baruch wrote down all of Jeremiah's dictation and many similar words were added. The king can't beat the scroll, the scroll will not go away. That, that's what they're arguing. So these two uh, chapters about the scroll of Jeremiah and probably the scroll of Deuteronomy, this is the moment when Judaism became a people of the book. The, this is the, these are the first identifiable books in the tradition and the way both scrolls are presented, they stand over against dominant ideology. They contradict the world that the kings and the priests were championing. And it's mind-boggling when you think that way. It is mind-boggling to think that the scroll has been entrusted to the church. It's the only place in town where the scroll is read. And uh, it's a great enigma 
that this book of contradiction has been put down in our midst. So it's no wonder that the church is a disputatious community. Some of us would like to burn the scroll, some of us like to burn parts of the scroll, some of us just make lectionaries and leave it out. <laughs> we have many strategies for picking out the parts that are congenial to the way we've got our life arranged. And uh, when you read the temptation narrative of Jesus in Luke 4 and Matthew, remember he gets three temptations from the devil, and Jesus responds with scripture all three times, he quotes the book of Deuteronomy. So th these two scrolls have a, a, a peculiar place uh, in, the, in the covenantal imagination of Israel. And uh, we continue in ways that we are able uh, to try to pay attention. It's amazing. Well, that's that one. Comment or question? Walter? Yes. Uh How do you suggest that we pull together the fact that in Isaiah uh, there is this, according to Texas, miraculous deliverance That's right. from Sennacherib, that when the Syrians at the door, um, that suddenly yep. uh, they were delivered. At least my reading of Isaiah, of Isaiah is that uh, the people are are just as dreadful as they are in the book of Jeremiah. Yep. They're, they're all faithless. They, there's the there's yep. same sort of problems. Yep. Whereas in Jeremiah, of course, uh, what you've been arguing is that uh, Jeremiah is saying, hey, you can't, uh, you can't refer back to that and think that's going to save you. Right. Yep. So how do we hold, if, we, if these texts are both dropped in our yep. midst, how yep. do we hold those yep. together? Let me look, look at the text first. Look at Isaiah. Um, 37, what Roger's talking about. Uh, the, the, the city is surrounded by the Assyrian army, uh, and the, the prophet says, by the way that Sennacherib came, that's the Assyrian emperor, he will go home, for I will defend this city to save it. And then the next Verse says, then the angel of the Lord, which means they don't know how to say it either, the angel of the Lord struck down 185,000 Assyrian soldiers and they all went home. So I think that this, this, this deliverance was in 701, and that's the tradition to which Hananiah is appealing when he says Jerusalem is safe. So what you have here in Isaiah is royal theology of God's unconditional promises. And what you have in Jeremiah is covenantal theology from Sinai. And these two biblical theologies are in incredible tension with each other so that interpretation, proclamation, whatever, is deciding and we're always doing this, is deciding which one of these theological traditions is the true one now for us. And uh, Jeremiah, because he is the priest of Anatoth, uh, is uh, situated here. Hananiah is situated here, and he's trying to make the case that this is a theology that matters to us now. And uh, I, I don't know uh, any way to reconcile these. I, I suppose that the, so 587 is over here, and it may be that the argument is that things were really worse. 
or it may be that the Babylonian army was simply more aggressive than the Assyrian army. It's, it's not explained, but when you see Hananiah as an heir to this tradition, you can see how vigorously the issue is joined. So, if you pick up Jeremiah Wright, Jeremiah Wright is situated here, and uh, everything got mobilized against him, and, and Obama ran for cover, because you don't say that, because God bless America. So we saw the same thing being played out. Come back at that, you want to? I guess I'm just wondering if, if the other tradition, the royal tradition, is one that still uh, can be a source of mean and hope for a community. Um, I'm sort of what, I'm trying to imagine what that community would be like that would appeal to that. Yep. Um, like certainly, you're trying to get us to see that the Jeremiah one is the right. to our situation. Yep. Um, rather than the previous tradition yep. just having disappeared altogether and yep. then invalidated. What, what, I would, what I think is true is that after 587, they go back and pick up this tradition mm. in exile. And uh, as you know, many of the many of the uh, royal promises and all that that we like at Christmas are thought to be dated in the exile. Uh, so there will come a, a branch out of the stump of Jesse, which is, which is that, which means that there were people in exile who thought there would be a restoration of the Davidic kingdom. And, and then we say, oh, it's Jesus. You know, that, so that's how we work it, and I think that's how they worked it. So it, it, that means it's highly contextual, uh, and one might entertain the thought that in this context, that tradition is valid and important, but it's false in this context. That, that's the argument. But then we have the same argument about uh, does, does, it, does the context make it invalid? And uh, the, as you know, the, the Bible doesn't work that out for us. <laughs> you know? I, I, uh, uh, since we're doing these two traditions, uh, in um, Luke 16, uh, Jesus tells the parable of the rich man and Lazarus, and the rich man is condemned because he won't feed Lazarus the poor man. And the way Jesus tells the parable, it's just a parable, the, the poor man dies and goes to the bosom of Abraham. That's, that's this tradition. The, the rich man who is condemned says, would you please send a messenger to my brothers so they don't be as stupid as I am? And the judge says, they got Moses, meaning the Torah, and that's all they're going to get. So you can see that Jesus is working both traditions and assigns uh, this tradition to the poor man and assigns this, this tradition to the rich man. So Je Jesus is very nimble about how he works that. So, by and large, uh, for many reasons, I suppose, the church has opted for this tradition. You can see why, why we would want to, and, and so on. Yeah. Other comment? Is that Isaiah story metaphorical, or is that historically it's commonly It's commonly taken to be. That, that, that the city was delivered is taken to be historical. The reasons given for it are, uh, are arguable. Uh, Herodotus, the, uh, the Greek historian, says that what happened is that the Assyrian army got hit by a plague and, and the troops were decimated or more, 
But then that's no problem. You say, well, yeah, who do you think sent the plague? So, so <laughs> but, but, but most, uh, most uh, interpreters uh, say that really is. And you might like to know that there is an old hypothesis that Psalm 46 arose out of this. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in time of trouble, therefore we will not fear. And then as you know, that became Luther's mighty fortress is our God. So you can see this, this turned out to be a very generative event in the imagination of the community. Yes? Especially in response to how the people requested God to change God's mind. Yep. Could you just comment more on that? Well, um, uh, what, what, that, what that teaches is that we have impact on our futures. What we decide matters. Uh, and uh, uh, God in the Old Testament never subscribed uh, to the idea that God is immutable and unchanging and all of that. So God is a, is a character in the transaction and then uh, how we act causes God to position God's self differently. That's, that's how they imagine God. And so uh, if, if this is the Lord of the covenant, uh, uh, this God is going to give blessings to people who obey Torah and not for those who don't. You know, that's, kind of, that's the reasoning. If you look in uh, Jeremiah 18, I, I mentioned this I think another time, uh, but there's, there's a very uh, clear uh, case of it. Um, verse uh, 7, 18-7, I will pluck up and tear down and destroy, but if that nation turns from its evil, I will change my mind. But then negatively, I will plant and build, but if they do evil, then I will change my mind. So this is a God who is uh, engaged uh, in uh, the, the covenantal conflicts. And, you know, in some ways that's uh, kind of how we conduct our most important relationships and so on. Want to come back at that? I think what I, uh, I, I always want to use the word, it scares me that my <coughs> actions could change God's actions. Yeah, but you see that the alternative to that is, is to say my actions are irrelevant. It doesn't matter what I do, what the hell. So this tradition uh, takes human conduct very seriously. Over here, what you tend to get is the promise that there's nothing you can do that will make me stop loving you. Uh, so they are in tension. And I think it's very useful for us to reflect uh, on uh, which one of these practices we were nurtured as children. It's amazing how many people uh, grew up in ferocious homes uh, for whom the good news of Marcus Borg and so on is very welcome. I think probably Marcus Borg grew up in such a home, and, and so on and so on. So we're all, um, we're all living out our nurture and the way we got situated before we knew we were being situated. So I, I think this stuff rings true. And um, it, is a, it is an endless uh, interpretive negotiation about that. What do I have up here? Yes? Could we, could there be an ultimate will? 
God's ultimate will, his ultimate best, then we fall covenantally or not yep. acknowledging his character. Yep. And so it's more of a, he's there ready to pull us along and we're the ones making the covenant <laughs> with him, kind of. Yep. I mean, it, it's not as if we're changing his mind. He has the best for us. He has an ultimate will. But yet, we just can't quite keep up with it. Well, that's a way to interpret it. It is a way. Yeah. The, the other side of, of this, in addition to, uh, to God willing us well, what this tradition says is that God will not be mocked, which means God has very high self-regard and wants to be taken seriously. And when you don't take, when we do not take God seriously, you know, that seems to arouse God on occasion, according to this imagination. Yeah. Yes, Bob. There's a theology that says uh, if we believe that God is omnipresent, then that means when I look around this room, I see God. Yeah. And it's pretty clear to me that how everybody in this room treats me is dependent on how I treat them. Yep. That's right. So you change your mind depending on how you get treated. Yep. <laughs> yep. yep. Uh, I want to do two other texts yet. Uh, I'm going to talk about uh, uh, 37, 38, which I call the silencing. And then I've got one other quick text to do after that. In uh, verse 17, what does this remind you of in the New Testament? Then King Zedekiah questioned Jeremiah secretly. Hmm? That's right. That's right. That is not the one I was thinking of. I was thinking of Nicodemus who came at night. But Herod, that's, that's wonderful. Yep. That is, the king was so desperate that he no longer relied on his cabinet, but he had to go to this uncredentialed poet to see if he could find something out. So he says, is there a word from the Lord? And Jeremiah says, yes. You will be given over to the hand of Babylon. And then I just wanted you to see this. In 38.4, the officials say to the king, this man ought to be put to death because, uh, and the, the Hebrew says, he is weakening the hands of the soldiers. He is undermining the war effort. He's an early peacenik, I guess. For this man is not seeking the shalom of this people so, verse 6, so they took Jeremiah and threw him into a cistern. And then he got out of the cistern. And then Zedekiah meets him again. And then Zedekiah says in 38, 24, do not let anyone know of this conversation or you will die. If the officials should hear that I have spoken with you, they will come and say, just tell us what you told the king. Do not conceal it from us. Then you shall say to them, oh, I just presented my, I, I, I didn't give the king any advice. So the, the king, he, the king is, this, this sounds a little bit like Richard Nixon maybe. He's, he's, he's scripting the denial so that he doesn't get in trouble with his advisors. So, there you go. Now, the, the last text that I want you to see, I put down here, is the protest. There are in the book of Jeremiah ten, uh, six prayers of Jeremiah. And uh, he does not get good answers from God. God is very brusque. This is the last one. Chapter 20, verse 7. O oh, Yahweh, 
you have enticed me. That can be translated, you have seduced me. It can be translated, if you look at other uses of the word, you have raped me. I wrote that in a manuscript once, and my um, secretary typed it, and she wrote on the margin, God may entice, God may seduce, God does not rape. She, that was <laughs> my little exegetical exercise for the day. You have overpowered me. That sounds like rape, maybe. You have prevailed, and I have become a laughingstock, and everyone mocks me. And whenever I speak out, I must shout, violence, violence! For the word of the Lord has become a reproach to me. But if I say I won't speak out, verse 9, if I say I won't speak your name anymore, I get heartburn. <laughs> Shut up in my bones, and I am weary, and I can't keep it in. Because everybody is scheming against me. Everybody is saying, denounce him. Let us denounce him. All my close friends are watching me fall on my face. They're saying perhaps he can be seduced and we can prevent. Maybe we can get him. Now, I don't know how you get from verse 10 to verse 11. But the Lord is with me, and they will not prevail. O Lord of hosts, you test me. You see the heart. Let me see your retributions on the sons of bitches that are doing this to me. <laughs> now, that'd be great if it ended there, but look at verse 14. These are some of the toughest verses in Scripture. This is, this is what Jeremiah has to say about his prophetic vocation. Cursed be the day I was born, the day that my mother born. Cursed be the doctor who told my father, you have a son. Let that doctor be like the cities of Sodom and Gomorrah. Let that doctor hear a cry in the morning and an alarm at night because he did not kill me in the womb. Why did I come? Why was I born for this? And it ends. And if you read the commentaries on these verses, interpreters can't think of anything to say. Except that this is the, this is the end result of being the carrier of the contradiction. I don't, I don't think clergy are the only ones charged with this. But there are a lot of clergy who just say, I, I quit, I couldn't do it anymore. I cannot live with this unbearable tension between what I have to say and what I dare not say. It's not a clergy problem, it's a church problem. It's a cultural problem of the hard edge of the truth of God in the world. And of course, uh, the way the story goes, he was right. Now one other text, look in Job 3. Verse Job 3, it's right in front of the book of Psalms. Okay. Verse 3, Job says, this is the first time Job speaks in the book. Well, he speaks a little, of it, but first poem. Let the day perish in which I was born, and the night that said a man child is conceived. Let that day be darkness. May God above not seek it or shine upon. Let gloom and deep darkness claim it. Let clouds settle. Let the blackness that night that let deep 
thick darkness seize it, for it is, let it not rejoice, let it not come into the number of the months. Yea, let that night be barren, let no joyful cry be heard, let those who curse it who curse the sea, those who are skilled to arouse the monster. Let the stars of the dawn be dark, let the hope for light but have none, may it be, and so on, so on, so on. There are people who think that Job 3 uh, is derivative from Jeremiah 20. Uh, so there are interpreters who propose uh, that the character of Job is a dramatic performance of the life of Jeremiah. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter if he's not, it's somebody, some other person with the same name. So. So the book of, and, and you may want to know that the name Job, the word Job means adversary. How's that for having a book of the Bible named adversary? This is, this is God's adversary. It is an adversary of the system and of the vocation of faith. And if you know the book of Job, if you follow it through, uh, Job finally pushes God to a somewhat different place. If you make that connection, uh, you could say that uh, the book of Job is the processing of the vocation of baptism because baptism puts us in contradiction to the dominant values of our society. My dad was a minister and my mother lived her life in deep anxiety that my father would cross the line and we would be homeless. So what we, what we try to do is to pay people to walk up to the line but not cross it. The problem is you don't ever know where the line is. <laughs> So we are, we, are a, we are a peculiar people because we have chosen to situate our lives in this deep problematic. And uh, we don't ever really escape it. Well, do you have a comment or observation, a question? Yes. Can you repeat what you just said? I, your words kind of trailed off. Sorry. That, that we have chosen to live in this dangerous place. What did I say then? Problematic. Hmm? problematic. That, that is so problematic. And our baptism is a decision to live there. Go ahead. Yes. Next week is going to be wonderful <laughs> because we're going to be over here and we're going to talk nothing but promises and hopes and rejoicing possibilities. <laughs> and by that time, one team or the other may have swept the series. <laughs> And we'll be free of that as well. <laughs> free at last, free at last. <laughs> but it's impossible to live on the line forever. You know, inadvertently we step over the That's right. And, That's right. Uh, then we not only have to suffer in this life, but we are afraid that everything we have stood for has come to nothing. That's right. That's right. Yep. Yes, Bob. Could you uh, comment on this? Uh, 
certainly these two viewpoints have huge tension. But it's also true that in the history of mankind, both have been dominant many times over. That's right. Almost, almost cyclical. That's right. Yep. Yep. You can trace that. You can trace it through the Bible and, and on. That's right. That's right. Yep. So the question is not which one, not which one is going to happen, but where are we? That's exactly it. And that, and that is always the interpretive question. Yeah. So it's a, it's a good exercise when you hear a text in church uh, out of your knowledge of the Bible ask, what other text ought we to be reading alongside this one? Hmm. Yep. I'll see you next week. <laughs>